Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Sylvain Geyer. I'm the head of corporate medical marketing at Sigvaris. And uh, with this, I would like to welcome you warmly to this new uh, global, first global MOH of the, of the year 2023 with the topic, a closer look into the pelvic congestion syndrome. Um, we will have today two presentations uh, looking more deeply into the aspect of pelvic wing disorders, one from the female part uh, or side and one from the male side. Um, but first of all, I have to pre the, pre the pleasure to introduce our moderator of today, um, Dr. Mohamed Omar Al Farouk. Um, Dr. Omar is from Cairo, Egypt, and uh, uh, vascular and endovascular surgeons by formation. Um, he completed his postgraduate vascular surgery training at the West Midland Vascular Rotary uh, in UK, where he uh, obtained also a fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of England and the Royal College of Edinburgh same year. Uh, after completing his training, uh, he joined the General Organization of Teaching Hospitals and Institutes in Cairo, Egypt, and um, he has written numerous research publications and given many presentations on his work. He's also an examiner of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. But beside that, um, Dr. Omar has become an important member also of the MOH family. Um, he has already participated in several MOHs uh, over the last years, where he had uh, different roles uh, in, in the expert panels, but also especially moderating the, the, the different events. And he's also providing high, highly welcomed uh, scientific support for the preparation and after work also regarding the MOHs when we are looking at the uh, analysis of the, of the different events that we had. Uh, Dr. Omar, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to have you with me for this moderation of this uh, event today. And with this, I would like to hand over for the uh, first introduction of the first speaker. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sylvian, and uh, all the success of MOH is due to your brilliant ideas and your very nice selection of very hot <laughs> topics. And congratulate you, Sylvian, for selecting such a topic. I'm really excited uh, that um, I am uh, one of the great uh, scientific um, family today discussing very interesting, rapidly changing topic. Let me introduce the first speaker from Germany, uh, Professor Tobias Hirsch. He is member of the Re European College of Philippology. He's very well known angiologist in Germany. He runs a meticulous endovascular procedure courses all over Europe, and he have uh, multiple uh, training courses over multiple variety of venous uh, diseases. He has multiple publication, uh, mostly interested on uh, venous treatment and management, venous stenting in chronic pelvic obstruction, very interesting topic. And he run a lot of uh, training workshops all over Europe. Uh, with us, two very well-known panelists will try to squeeze their experience. Uh, both of them are very dear friends from Turkey and from China. Let me start with our uh, eminent panelist, a very well-known vascular surgeon from Turkey, Professor Suat Dugans. He is professor of uh, Health Science University in Gulen, which is a school of medicine in Ankara in Turkey, and he played a major part uh, during the last uh, unfortunate event of the earthquake. And uh, with us, a very dear colleague from China, young star from China, Professor Wang Xiang, and now we are friend on WeChat, and he is a deputy director of vascular surgery department in Shanghai which is second or third largest city in China. He worked in Tonji University, very well-known university of China, and he has a number of not just scientific paper, but number of inventions. He has patent, uh, patent discovery, um, which is uh, belong to him and to his uh, discovery. He is also a member of the diabetic food group of the Chinese medical doctors, and he is a member of the Young Committee of Vascular Surgeon Branch of Shanghai Medical Association. I would welcome you all 
I'm really enjoying your uh, company. I'm very eager for a fascinating uh, journey over science. And the mic to you, Tobias, we're all uh, ears to your fantastic lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar, for this uh, kind introduction of my person. And uh, thank you, uh, Sylvain and uh, Sigvaris, for inviting me to uh, be a part of this um, great uh, uh, expert panel. I want to give you some information about uh, pelvic venous disorders. Uh, and uh, my goal is to tell you about how to identify um, uh, the right patient uh, for the right procedure. I want to share my screen now. I hope you can see it. Is it working? Yep. So Perfect. Great. Thank so you. Let's start. This is my conflict of interest. I'm here today. Patients are presenting with a suspected case of pelvic venous disorders um, can be identified by an indication of non saphenous atypical leg veins. Leg veins is what we are uh, dealing with um, when we are uh, phlebologists, but the non saphenous uh, varicose veins can be a sign for pelvic venous disorders. Uh, but they also have um, been sent by the gynecologists. Or we um, explore further and find that they suffer from pelvic or flank pain. Vulva varicose veins, dispar unia, and flank pain are typical signs and symptoms, but our patients uh, also can suffer from several other issues. And this slide shows the different conditions that can cause pelvic venous disorders. This is from a body donor from our anatomical uh, institute of the um, Martin Luther University here in my hometown, Halle. One cause can be ovarian vein reflux. Then we have left renal vein compression. This is what we call the nutcracker syndrome. We can have a left common iliac vein compression, um, the so-called my Turner syndrome. And then we have pelvic origin varicose veins connected to pelvic leak points. Various diagnostic tools can be brought on board to make a diagnosis. But in fact, we are talking about a very complex disease. And despite all these highly developed imaging techniques, duplex ultrasound, IVUS, MR, venogram, and radiography, we still are unable to verify the disease 100% uh, of the time. The most important tools are physical examination and patient history, a proper patient assessment. In 2021, a classification came out um, that has been published by Mark Meissner and co-authors in phlebology and journal of vascular surgery and uh, venous and uh, lymphatic disorders at the same time. One publication in two journals, that has to be very important. The SVP classification is a very valuable instrument to describe the dis different forms of um, pelvic venous disorders, but in my eyes, also to understand the disease. I, I think the classification is comparable to the CEAP classification um, for chronic venous insufficiency. This is the key illustration from the paper that concludes the different zones uh, that can be affected uh, by uh, the disease. The zone of the left renal vein, the zone of the gonadal and internal iliac veins, the zone of the proximal parts of extra pelvic veins, and then the leg veins. Let me come back to patient assessment. 
we have to localize the pain. We needed a clear description and a situational classification. It's important to know um, the patient's medical history with respect to gynecolo uh, gynecological procedures and pregnancies. And last but not least, um, the patient's psychological condition plays an important role. Partner conflict, all these things have to be discussed with the patient. A very useful assessment tool is a self-assessment questionnaire. As we use one in my practice in German language, um, uh, I use this one for the uh, presentation here from uh, Dr. Ram uh, Narayanan from uh, Singapore. You can download it from his clinic website, the Venus Clinic. It's a do-it-yourself assessment uh, that his patients can utilize themselves. In my practice, it's a simple sheet uh, of paper my nurses provide uh, for, for the patient. Following a good assessment regime um, makes it easier to determine uh, your patient pathway uh, forward. Do we need a more thorough uh, vascular examination or a gynecologist, internist, surgeon, or physiotherapist? Is cross-sectional imaging required or is duplex ultrasound uh, enough? Is there a need for coiling or um, other interventions or for varicose vein treatment? Do we need additional psychological and behavioral treatment? Currently, the literature provides us very few uh, recommendations. One of uh, the most important papers is this UIP consensus document from uh, 2019. Um, you can read all about the disease, its diagnostic methods and uh, therapies, but there is no clear recommendation on the workflow. Then we have the topical uh, 2022 uh, ESVS guidelines. They are always uh, a good recommendation and uh, they uh, consider uh, something. They offer recommendations. They recommend for female patients with pelvic pain and a clinical suspicion of pelvic venous disorders, exclusion of other causes of pain is recommended. And here we are back to a patient assessment. And this is a class uh, one level C uh, recommendation. Then the, uh, the guideline recommends for patients with varicose veins of pelvic origin without pelvic symptoms, local procedures for varicose veins and related pelvic escape points should be considered as initial uh, therapeutic uh, approach. Whereas for patients with varicose veins of pelvic origin with pelvic symptoms uh, requiring treatment, pelvic vein embolization should be considered to reduce the symptoms. The new guideline recommends um, the intervention uh, to treat um, uh, pelvic pain uh, forms of the uh, PVD. But for patients with varicose veins of pelvic origin without pelvic symptoms, pelvic vein embolization as initial treatment should not be performed. And this is very important because um, it's not that easy to find um, expert groups that are, um, that are working in this field in uh, every country, in every uh, region. Uh, the authors of the uh, guideline uh, included a practical flowchart one drawback is that this guideline uh, on managing chronic uh, venous diseases of lower limbs uh, doesn't include all facets of the uh, pelvic venous disorders, but it's definitely very helpful. We learn uh, from the flowchart that the first step is to distinguish between the entities uh, varicose veins with or without uh, pelvic symptoms. You see that uh, on the uh, left-hand side. And so we see if we have patients with varicose veins, but without pelvic symptoms, we can go the way with minimal invasive procedures like foam sclerotherapy or phlebectomy. 
uh, or we can do uh, conservative treatments. And here we are back to compression uh, therapy. If the patients uh, suffer from varicose veins with pelvic uh, symptoms, um, the intervention um, is uh, another uh, way to treat our patients. Uh, we can treat the uh, iliac or renal vein uh, compression using um, with uh, by stenting or alternative techniques, or we can uh, do embolization of gonal veins. But also we have uh, the opportunity to immediately start treating our patients uh, conservatively using uh, compression hosiery and uh, hormonal treatment. I will come back to that. These are um, the three columns of treatment. And once we have assessed our patient, once we have understood the individual disease, we can start with a therapy. And um, I think uh, the, um, the um, guidelines have a strong recommendation for um, for interventional treatment, but um, we don't have to keep in mind that there are also uh, operative techniques and specialists who are dealing with that uh, on a very high level. And so we don't have to forget that we can also do open surgery. We can uh, do uh, ovarian vein ligation, um, laparoscopic ovarian la vein ligation. We can do a, a ovarian vein resection uni or bilateral, and we have the opportunity for left renal vein transposition. And uh, one of the uh, most topical uh, ways is external stenting. And then we have uh, the uh, opportunity to do it interventionally. Uh, and this is uh, hyped at the moment. We uh, can do ovarian vein embolization or embolization of the internal iliac veins. We have the opportunity to put a stent into uh, an occluded or compressed left uh, renal vein. Um, we can uh, uh, put a stent into iliac veins uh, for nivel and for my uh, Turner, uh, Turner, Turner syndrome or for post thrombotic syndrome in this area. And then we have uh, sclerotherapy and we combine all these uh, types of uh, treatment. And last but not least, we have, uh, we have to um, to, to have a, a similar uh, treatment uh, with our patients uh, with compression therapy, with painkillers, and also there are also trials with venoactive drugs, MPFF. In Germany, we use uh, horse chestnut e extract and red vine leaves, and there, are ex there is experience with uh, MPA. And uh, don't forget um, that the patients uh, might need uh, psychotherapy or psychosomatic um, guidance. Before I come to my conclusion, uh, I will um, I will present uh, two of my um, patients I have seen uh, during the last weeks. This is a 22 year old um, female, very slim, no birth, no children, and she was suffering from chronic pelvic pain. Um, uh, uh, she she, uh, she has suffered uh, for um, six or eight months, not too long, but uh, six months is um, the uh, is a range uh, that we can uh, call it a chronic pelvic pain. She uh, suffer, suffered from dyspareunia, uh, but also bloated belly, postprandial abdom abdominal pain. And she has uh, also observed uh, hematuria. Sorry. The point was, it was a very, very long travel uh, to an expert for pelvic venous disorders. Uh, she saw her gynecologist uh, more than four times um, he excluded um, endometriosis. He treated uh, with antibiotics. And then she um, uh, came into uh, MR uh, scan. And they saw that there are uh, huge varicose veins in the pelvis. And that's why she came to our center. And this is what I saw uh, uh, in the uh, duplex ultrasound. 
we see a doubled uh, left ovarian uh, veins um, with a, a big caliber. And this is, um, uh, is an image of the aorta and the left ovarian vein in, um, um, in the transverse uh, section. And as you can see, the aorta and the um, uh, left ovarian vein have the same color. The same color red in that time means that they flow in the same direction. And um, this is the problem. If the left ovarian vein goes in the same direction like the aorta, then it's an insufficiency. And then I found um, these um, huge uh, varicose veins in the pelvis. And so uh, it was clear that this is um, her uh, problem. Uh, the point is, she is not a typical patient. 22 years, um, no birth. This is not um, a, a case that we uh, see uh, frequently, but um, uh, the diagnosis was clear. And uh, uh, so we uh, uh, sent her to uh, MR venogram. And you see here on the right hand side, uh, this is the left ovarian vein with a, um, with a big caliber and uh, a an very early reflux filling the, um, the uh, peri ovarian network. And then we see uh, the backflow of the right um, ovarian vein. And so we decided uh, to uh, treat her. One special uh, issue was that um, we have to, we have to uh, think about where is that from? No birth, no typical uh, risk situation. And uh, so she's also suspected for having um, a nutcracker syndrome. But uh, it's not uh, the first um, decision to treat that with a stent because we know that there is a higher rate for um, for complications. And so the plan is to start with gonadal vein occlusion and um, um, using coils or plug and in combination with with sclerotherapy. And after that, we will see um, if there is a, a need for um, for the treatment of the renal vein also. Uh, this is from a different patient because uh, the patient I have introduced is not yet uh, still not uh, treated, but this is how we uh, do it. We, we see uh, another patient with very, very um, wide uh, ovarian veins and with a reflux. Um, and this is the uh, um, phlebography. And the first uh, step is to... Um, apply um, the etoxyscleral foam um, using the catheter into the um, periovarian network. Uh, what you see is the foam uh, with uh, a contrast medium. And the next step is to occlude the vein with the coils. You see the coils here. And um, uh, once the coil is set, uh, there is no, um, no persisting a flow uh, in the periovarian uh, veins. And this is how it works when we have to treat a left ovarian vein insufficiency. Here we have a, a different case. It's a 30-year-old woman uh, for birth, very slim as well. And uh, she suffered from pudendal varicose veins and uh, atypical uh, leg veins, but no um, pelvic pain uh, symptoms. And uh, if you see varicose veins like that, then this is not caused by um, saphenous vein um, uh, insufficiency. Uh, we have to find the pelvic uh, leak point, and uh, you can see that we can um, uh, have a, great, uh, a good image of the reflux uh, in this uh, region as well. And so we decided to do an ultrasound-guided sclerotherapy of the pelvic escape point for first, and then therapy of the uh, external varicose uh, veins um, in the labial uh, area and uh, on the leg, uh, and no intervention of the gonadal veins. Uh, this could be an option in case of a recurrence. Here we have these uh, peri, uh, per perineal um, uh, vein, uh, six millimeters. Uh, it's it's a good caliber, I would say. And this is um, once uh, the patient is doing a Valsalva maneuver. And then uh, you have to find um, 
these uh, bead-like networks uh, in the labial region and the perineal region uh, in order to treat uh, them in a special way. I hope you can, you can see that. Here we have um, the vein, and this is the needle. I move the needle a little bit um, to, to make it easier to find, uh, to find it for you uh, for the presentation. And then I apply the foam. This is the typical image on the right-hand side. And you can see uh, like the foam uh, flows into, the, uh, into this network. Another image uh, from that region is here. I apply and you see uh, the foam. And it's always necessary to, to have a control one week later or two weeks later, uh, because um, in, um, in, in most cases, there are uh, some varicose veins left, so that um, a, a repetition of uh, the procedure is needed. So let me conclude. First of all, a proper patient assessment is crucial to identify the right patient for the right procedure. You have to talk with the patient. You have to listen to uh, what the patient is telling you about the story. Duplex ultrasound is the basic imaging tool for pelvic venous disorders, both with or without pelvic pain. And the point is, appropriate cross-sectional imaging is not available everywhere and should only be considered if other disorders are excluded and pain, urinary symptoms, and sexual dysfunction are the leading complaints. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much. That is fascinating lecture. Very, very enjoyable. Um, uh, excellent uh, illustration. And I'm sure it will trigger a huge amount of questions. Um, we would like to answer all questions um, if we can. And please put your question either into Q&A section or you can put it into the, uh, the even chat section. So I have here uh, two questions. I would like to uh, put them to Tobias and see a panelist and other speaker, uh, uh, our dearest Mark Whiteley, which I will present him before his uh, his presentation because he has, I think, about five pages of uh, short CV for his achievement. So the first question is from Dr. Professor Yasser. He said, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. When can we decide to embolize or to do laparoscopic vein surgery? Uh, when do you choose which way of treatment? In your slide, you mentioned the conservative arm, the operative arm, and the minimally invasive arm. When do you choose which is the best for the patient, Professor Tobias? It's a different question. I think this uh, is also depending on the expertise of the doctor who is doing that. So I know that there are uh, very good surgeons uh, who very often do open or laparoscopic uh, surgery. And I think then this is the way for the patient. This could be good. On the other hand, you have to know that if you do open surgery, you will have scars and you uh, th there will be uh, more problems inside the belly. So this can be um, a contraindication in my eyes. But I think especially when it comes to um, when it comes to nutcracker syndrome treatment, um, you have always to think about if an interventional course using um, stents is always the best option because we know that stent migration is um, is a very real uh, problem we have to discuss. and uh, if the anatomical conditions are not appropriate for stenting, um, I think the choice uh, could be uh, could go into the direction of open surgery. But on the other hand, um, for cases of ovarian vein uh, reflux, uh, the interventional way is always the best. My experience is that it's often a very long way for um, decision-making for the patient. So when the patient is in my practice, um, we uh, find out what's the problem. We find um, the reflux of the ovarian uh, vein embolized, uh, ovarian vein reflux, and I tell them what can be done with them. Uh, I, most of the cases are women. 
Um, and then it takes a longer time to decide for them. And that's why we have to immediately start treating them conservatively because it takes half a year for decision making or for finding uh, uh, an expert. 80% um, of the patients coming um, into my practice are not from my region. They come from all over the country. And so uh, it's necessary to find anybody. We, we have a network for that. And so it takes a little time to organize uh, the best way for the patient. And then the patient needs a little time to, to come to his decision. And um, so this is the place we have for conservative treatment. And uh, the decision for which kind of treatment, open surgery versus um, uh, versus uh, intervention depends on the center uh, you are going to. But I, I wouldn't say I would not agree to the um, to the uh, current um, ESVS guideline that always interventional way is uh, the first way. Okay, I, I would like to hear obviously the comment of our uh, three uh, eminent uh, speaker and panelists. Uh, I would like to know the opinion of Mark Whiteley. Uh, and Dugans, and from China also, I would like to be to specific uh, Jung. How to compare which is the best way? Because we don't have head-to-head -head study, a surgery, better intervention. What do you do in UK? What do you do in Turkey? What do you do in China? Start by Mark Whiteley. Thank you very much. To, to answer the question, I, I think we need to first of all say that we're only talking about reflux disease to begin with. Because when we talk about obstructive disease, we've got a whole host of different things about how much scarring there is, stenting, et cetera. And that's a different discussion. I think if we talk about the commonest, which is reflux disease, I think the big problem is, is how you diagnose it. Because those of us who use transvaginal duplex using the whole stock Harrison protocol, which we published in 2006, when the patient's at 45 degrees, we know that many of the patients with ovarian vein uh, reflux, it's distal, to begin with before it becomes proximal, just like legs, it's an ascending problem. And also we know that the vast majority of patients, when you actually look in the deep pelvis, have, have problems with the internal iliac veins and the pudendal veins and the obturator veins. And so the problem is a lot of the, a lot of the work that is so say being done is people who are only really looking at the truncal veins at the mid and upper section. So we have quite a simple answer then, because you can't really do open or laparoscopic surgery deep down on the internal iliac veins, which is the major problem in pelvic congestion. Um, and you wouldn't do uh, laparoscopic surgery or open surgery if it was only distal gonadal veins as well. So in the 20 odd years, 22 years we've been treating this condition, we've never even looked at laparoscopic surgery. We considered it very, very early, but we rejected it very quickly because we can't treat the major problem, which is the distal reflux, particularly of the internal iliac veins and their tributaries. Okay. Do you think high foot technology can play a role in such a condition? Because I know you said that your penetration power of high foot maybe is maybe one inch, but do you think the future you can treat it with high foot, Mark? Not in the short term, um, because you can't, the hyphu obviously wouldn't be going through the, uh, wouldn't go through the bowel if you've got any bowel in the way. So, uh, because the, uh, you've got to have solid tissue for it to go through full of fluid. You can't, you can't through it go through gas. If you believe in uh, treating only the exit points, the pelvic leak points, which I have a major problem with, but that's another discussion. I think there's a possibility that you could use hyphu for the leak points if you were doing it from below and if you worked with uh, the companies to make the head uh, in a position where you could actually get it into the right place from uh, from uh, distally not with the current machine the current machine um, is excellent for the trunk of veins but it's one of those things it's a bit like radio frequency and laser was in 1999-2000 we're just sort of really finding how to make it really work so I think this is a step too far in the short term but I think the high food technology for everyone interested in veins for the next 20 years 10 to 20 years is just going to be a fantastic story but that's a that's a, I think we have to get it right in the legs first. Excellent, excellent. Professor Swad Duganzi, uh, what's your reflection about comparing a um, different method of treatment of uh, PCV? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Alfaro. 
Uh, first of all, I want to talk, thank to the Sigvaris company for inviting us uh, for this excellent uh, online meeting. And to be together with excellent speakers and discussions, I'm very happy to be with you. And uh, Tobias made a very, very wonderful overview about the pelvic uh, congestion disorder. And uh, we know about the diagnosis, we, we learned something about the classification and treatment modalities. The, the issue is, uh, and we are, I'm also looking for the uh, questions uh, from the audience as well. Actually, I, I agree with Tobias because it is mostly related with the experience of the uh, surgeon or angiologist who is the, treating the therapy. But uh, actually, we are now uh, living in an uh, era that we, we are trying to make everything in, is minimally invasive. And if we have a chance to treat it angi angiographically, why do we go for a surgical procedure? So it, it, it is, the, it yeah. is not, of course, we are, uh, some of us are surgeons, we are able to uh, make it uh, as the surgical ways. But if there is an angiographic way uh, without any incision, why, why do we make uh, some uh, incision and making surgical procedures? Uh, actually, in my practice as well, I'm just doing angiographically uh, many, all, all of our patients, and we don't need uh, surgical procedures for those things. And especially when we look at the results uh, published by Dr. Whiteley's group, we know that especially eight to six year results uh, of these pelvic uh, congestion uh, patients, we have excellent results. And in the long term, many of them do not have uh, even knee reflux. But as we know it from the lower leg varicose vein, for example, in the long term, for example, if we treat the left over the vein, Maybe in the in the follow up we can have some knee reflux in the internal iliac veins or in the right sided ovarian vein. So this is a, this is similar for the leg part. So we have to follow these patients, and if the symptoms come back, we need to analyze them again. And if maybe we can also have a chance to miss the other refluxing points. That's why the uh, diagnostic workup for those patients is highly important. And as Dr. Whiteley explained, we shouldn't miss the uh, internal iliac vein refluxes because uh, this is a very uh, big uh, source of reflux point and many of those patients can uh, have uh, internal iliac vein reflux uh, as well. But uh, from my point of view, if we will uh, treat those patients, especially uh, for the internal iliac vein part, uh, we I think we we need we need to go selectively as deep as possible and we need to use uh, larger size coils. And we need to combine them with uh, maybe liquid embolic agents because in my practice, I have my one of my patients, I, I had a, a coil migration, unfortunately, in the follow-up, which is detected uh, coincidentally. Yes, in an, uh, the chest X-ray, uh, it, it was a coincident finding. Patient had no symptoms, but uh, it was a patient which, which I treated for internal iliac vein uh, reflux. So... Uh, for those patients, especially if we will treat internal iliac vein insufficiencies, uh, we shouldn't uh, forget about the coil migration risk. Uh, the, the risk of coil migration in the ovaric vein is not that high because uh, there is too much uh, enough, uh, let's say, distance. Uh, and if we use uh, larger coils and if we combine them with liquid embolic agents, of course, uh, it works well in those uh, situations but we shouldn't forget them. And on the other hand, I want to highlight another issue which uh, maybe Tobias uh, should cover it, but uh, since it, it is a less time, we shouldn't also forget uh, pelvic floor muscles. In many of those patients, there is a weakness also in the pelvic floor muscles and uh, to make some physical therapies and some exercises at the uh, which is strengthening the power of the pelvic floor muscles, which they also help uh, for those patients' symptoms. This is, we shouldn't also forget about that. And also, uh, I, I also uh, want to mention about uh, some compression related with the uh, pelvic disorders uh, problems because. Uh, as we know that at the uh, which compression stockings we are using uh, mainly is not that helpful if we are not using the maybe penthouse trousers, uh, sorry, penthouse stockings for those patients. But as far as I know, also from uh, Dr. Mike, Mark Whiteley, there are some uh, tights uh, which are uh, has the ability to make some compression uh, at the 
pelvic pelvic escape points and pelvic part. So I think if we will evaluate those patients as a whole, uh, uh, we need to uh, define uh, what is the level of the uh, the insufficiency and does these patients need the therapy as well? Uh, as a, for example, should we do it from the uh, vulvar varicosities only, or should we combine it with uh, ovarian vein or internal iliac vein embolization? This this is a very, uh, let's say, delicate uh, issue, and we we need we need to highlight every issue before giving any therapy to any patient. This is uh, which I want to mention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now I'm very eager to know the opinion of Professor Wang Chiang. Um, is this disease found in China? Is it common? And what is the preferred method of treatment you choose for your patient, Professor Chiang? Uh, thank you for, for inv inviting me for this conference. And uh, for uh, uh, this uh, PVD is not so common in China. Uh, until now, because most patients are uh, in, um, uh, it's not in our vascular surgery department. Uh, it depends on their uh, symptoms, and uh, maybe other doctor will invite, uh, uh, will give give us this kinds of patient. And uh, in my opinion, if a patient with PVD uh, operation will be the last choice, and uh, uh, we always do the endovascular therapy first. And also, uh, like uh, Professor Tobia said, I think the point is uh, to find the right patient for the right procedure. So, uh, yes, we have the SVP classification, but we don't have a uh, a, a symptom symptom grade system so it's very hard for us to choose the right patient yeah. and uh, uh, for the for, uh, for example the first patient uh, mentioned by dr tobias the young young girl uh, age 22 is very slim and have a neck cracker syndrome so uh, i have a question if the um, PVD is caused by the uh, red uh, renal or uh, renal vein, renal vein compression. Uh, if we only ablate uh, uh, embolize embolize the OV ovarian veins, uh, if the syndrome will be getting better in a few years later, and uh, I I think maybe because this girl is very slim, is very thin. So maybe we can do some something conservative, uh, maybe do some uh, body position change, uh, do some compression therapy, if or let the girl eat more and more, <laughs> get fat. Maybe the cracker, uh, maybe the compression will get uh, and will get not so worse. And uh, the syndrome could be better because he only have the uh, uh, only have the the symptomatic for yeah. two uh, for eight months. And do, do you like to answer that question. because of topics? Yes. There, there is yes. Um, the point is where is this reflux in the ovarian vein from in this two, 22 year old woman? And so it is suspected to be caused um, by the nutcracker. On the other hand, we know that the patient is in a flat position and we see a lot of cases uh, that are suspected for a compression of the uh, left renal vein, but this is not always um, uh, a nutcracker uh, syndrome. We do uh, ultrasound examinations in a standing position with a tilt table. And so we can see like the, the angle of uh, the um, uh, mesenteric artery goes uh, wider and in a standing position, there is no, the, the, the belly, uh, the, um, the gut goes down, uh, the angle is changing. And then uh, in a standing position, there is no 
uh, not Krakow uh, left. But um, the other point is that um, the um, the coiling of the uh, ovarian vein is a safe procedure, but uh, the uh, stenting of uh, the renal vein is, in my eyes, I'm very critical um, uh, with respect to this uh, option, and that's why I would, yes, uh, would uh, only with the uh, embolization treatment, and if it becomes better, we are successful. If it it becomes worse uh, in the in the next month or years, maybe because the the, the uh, occlusion of the left renal vein is and is keeping the problem, um, then we have to uh, think about that new. And then your idea is co completely correct. The, the patient will change. She will um, she will um, get pregnant. She will uh, have uh, some kilograms more, and maybe this uh, this physical precondition will change a little bit, and so we can uh, the, the time will work for us. And so it's better to go step by step instead of uh, doing all the techniques that are available at the moment. We I, I'm <laughs> internal um, I'm, I'm from in, internal medicine, and so I I used to wait um, for the patients. Okay, so I will ask my co-moderator Sylvie, and we have uh, three questions more. So what do you think regarding the time? Why shall we take one and then go for the next lecture? Yes, please. I think we have enough time to, to answer also this question. Oh, brilliant. Okay. <laughs> so we have, excellent. Uh, we have a question from Professor Edwin Stefan uh, to uh, Tobias. Um, opinion about left renal vein transposition. Does this not stretch an already stretched vein? Uh, well, that's a question, but uh, if, if you are a vascular surgeon, I will probably will give a hint. It doesn't stretch because you put it uh, in front, you actually save time and you can do vein graft, you can do vein bypass. So we don't stretch any vein, otherwise anastomosis wouldn't work. But Professor Tobias. No, thank you for this answer because uh, <laughs> I have no experience with this open Exactly. Thread. And so yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Uh, okay. So uh, stretching is not an issue for vascular surgeon. We don't do any anastomosis under stretch because this will make anastomosis fail. And you can have you can use a great saphenous vein. You can use either paneled or straightforward, but uh, it's not worry at all stretching of veins. Now the last question the I will last take. Question I will is uh, thank you Tobias for a great lecture which one is better amplets plug or coiling that's a difficult question mark i have used yeah I, I have used both in in pelvic congestion but i'm very eager to know your opinion Tobias and and all the rest I cannot answer that question because I do not uh, the interventions by myself. I cooperate um, with uh, two hospitals um, in my neighborhood, and yeah. um, I trust in their decisions. I, I cannot uh, answer that. But there are uh, maybe uh, uh, Mark people or like to bias. I, I actually don't. Um, I actually don't do the uh, the coiling myself. My radiologists do, but I keep a very close track on all of the results. Obviously, and the problem is why we need to coil is we need to coil. We use foam sclerotherapy at the bottom, and then we coil over a long section on the way up, like you would have late with a laser or anything else. You want a long section, and the reason we would never use a plug or a single plug at least, is because you can bypass a plug. And if yeah. you just, it's, it's the same if you do a laparoscopic clip in one place, many, many times you come back a year later and you find you've opened up a vein around it and it's useless. So if you want to ablate the vein, you have to ablate a long section of it, just like great saphenous vein, small saphenous vein. You yeah. do not want to put just one block in it. And that's why we would never use a plug by itself. Excellent. I can see uh, raised the hand by Professor Swad Duganzi. Uh, I would like to hear your opinion. Actually, the the, the plugs are not that as, uh, good to treat, uh, let's say, ovarian vein reflux because, especially for the plug sizing, is really important. So you have to oversize them because if you have a migration uh, that you use uh, for a small uh, plug, it is much more problematic than from a mi migration of a coil. 
And on the other hand, there are a lot of you know ascending collaterals or many branches uh, when you give the contrast. So it is it is really difficult to treat uh, by using one plug. That's why coils are more uh, uh, let's say good to use uh, treating uh, such type of uh, conditions. Okay, uh, Professor Wang, you want to add your opinion? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one difference between these two methods. The sheath of plug is much bigger than coil. So uh, sometimes we maybe use uh, coil, maybe the patient will get, feel better. And uh, But uh, when we use plug, the, uh, the, the procedure will get faster and uh, we, the radio will get less. So it's good for yeah. doctor, I think. Yeah, I've actually... But one of the reasons I went to take an embolization course was due to I want to treat this disease. So I've used foam, a toxic killer roll. I've used um, pushable coil, and I've used detachable coil. I've used amplitude plug. I've used sandwich technique, which is a plug and then foam <clears throat> and the last plug, which is called sandwich technique. And to to get an evidence based answer. I don't know which is better. I really don't know. And I hope if we have a number of cases to know which is a better embolization, which concentration, which technique, but we don't have this knowledge. That is why uh, I would say maybe, I'm not sure, maybe I've done a hundred of these uh, embolization to pelvic congestion syndrome. Each 10 or 20 is different technique. And can I say which one is better? I really can't. So uh, I, I think we need to get a registry of embolization technique to pelvic congestion syndrome. I hope we can get an answer then. But if you want to start, start safe. No embolization, no coil. Because one of the worst things of, of coil, when the patient gets a chest X-ray six months later and he found coil in the lung. It's usually asymptomatic, but it is not nice in the beginning of your career. So I would advise maybe sclerotherapy technique where it is a small caliber, it's easily controlled, you can uh, play with the, with the dilution concentration, can be easily repeated and not expensive. And this is for the beginning of your career. Later on, I hope with uh, such expertise, we can get the correct answer, which is better. So uh, with my dearest co-moderator, shall we, uh, <laughs> what do you think? Shall we go to yes, the- Yes, please. Uh, yeah, it's really a pity. Uh, it's a pity that we have to interrupt this, this very great uh, yes, uh, yes. discussions, but we, we will see the, the questions anyway, and we have the possibility also to answer them later with uh, uh, Tobias together. Um, yeah. For that, I would like to ask uh, Khaled to, to show the, the, the first poll questions. Yeah. So um, you have one single choice like written here. So pelvic venous uh, disorders is a disease and that it only affects women, is always caused by gonadal vein incompetence, can be treated with open surgery and the vascular interventions conservatively, and or all answers are correct. Uh, please make a choice. We wait a few seconds until we get the, the, the feedback from the audience. Excellent. Uh, I would like to take the time they are answering the question to ask Mark, is, is there is a compression treatment for pelvic congestion syndrome? I'm interested to, to know <laughs> if there's compression therapy for that. Thank you very much. In fact, it's nothing to do with me so much um, as uh, it's actually um, uh, Professor Sergei Gavrilov from, uh, from Russia who published a very interesting paper saying that compression did work. Um, and relieve symptoms. Um, and what we've done is uh, Baufine very kindly has has um, supported us and we're trying doing a study to confirm if that actually is the case in a randomized situation. So uh, there is one paper, as I say, from Gavrilov's unit that su suggests that it does work. We're trying to perform a uh, study to see if it does. The problem we have with it is, of course, is there's nothing designed specially for it. And the the, pel the female pelvis is, is solid muscle and bone on three three points at the back. There's the sacrum, the uh, pelvis, or the eyelid. So all you're actually doing is pushing on the front, and from underneath, almost no compression the way it is at the moment pushes on any of the leak points. So we're a little skeptical as to whether it actually has a, a, a physical effect, but whether there's a psychological effect of the compression. That's that's for the study to show. So we're looking at 
patient sort of uh, views it's hard to think anatomically how it can have much of an effect it's it's not like a leg which is easy to compress uh, yeah. although i'm sure sig virus would tell is not easy but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's hard to yeah. compress yeah. well Absolutely. okay but I, I know i've read your one of your very nice paper that one in six women with pelvic congestion syndrome already have varicose vein to lower limb yeah, well, it's the, other way around, it's the other way around. It's actually, if you look at people who are running vein clinics, one in six women who come to you with leg varicose veins have got them because a major component is coming from pelvic veins. And that means, okay. so everyone who's doing varicose veins in the legs should be looking for pelvic congestion the whole time. The only reason I got involved in pelvic congestion is it's the only way you can stop these patients coming back year after year after year with their veins coming back again. Excellent. Um, so. Great. We, 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 yeah, we can get the answer to the question. We have uh, already the feedback from the first poll question. So we have 62% uh, that uh, uh, marked the correct answer. That's uh, really interesting. We have one person that uh, mentioned that it only affects women. We will hear anything uh, different about that from, from Mark afterwards. Uh, Tobias, any comments on the, on the feedback that uh, we have received? For the first question, or is it no surprise for you? It, it's not a surprise, um, <laughs> but I'm satisfied with that. Great. Um, okay. We have we have a second one it's for it's only a women's disease uh, with the next uh, presentation. <laughs> exactly. So the second one, uh, once again, single choice is the, the first step of diagnosis pathway in patients suspect for PEVD is duplex ultrasound. MR venography, clinical patient assessment and patient history, or our HRCT scan on the retroperitoneal space. Okay, Khaled, do we have already the results? Okay, here, similar uh, result, also 61% for the right answer C. So, uh, and a huge part for the duplex ultrasound. Any comments on this, Tobias, from your side? I think it's quite good, so, because um, duplex ultrasound is available and takes a long time to perform and so you have a, a you have time enough to talk with the patient and to make a, a patient assessment great okay thanks a lot for participating so dr omar we can proceed with the next presentation and the introduction of the second speaker yes well i like to introduce my dear dear friend mark whitely uh, if there is one man who affected the world with on the venous disease it is mark whitely no question about it he's a consultant venous surgeon trained in san bartholomew hospital in london he's lecturer in oxford university uh, from 1995 to 1998 he was the first one to introduce microwave venous ablation in Europe in 2019. He's also a founder of Whiteley Clinic, which he trained a lot of um, a lot of doctors on venous intervention. He's also author of multiple books, how to treat venous ulcer and venous disease. Not only that, but he actually affected the politics in the United Kingdom. He had a great lecture about venous ulcer to the House of Commons which uh, is going to affect how they are dealing with such a problem. Uh, I, I guarantee you will enjoy not every minute, not every second, but every vento second of his lecture, Professor Mark Whiteley. Thank you so much, Ma'am. That's such a kind and probably uh, probably over the top uh, presentation, but it's lovely to uh, it's lovely to hear that. Thank you very much. Uh, it certainly has been my life, venous disease, and I find it phenomenally interesting. And I, I love discussions like this where people can come together, especially when uh, especially when we can have really good discussions, which aren't arguments, but we can put different points forward. And I've already got two pages worth of notes of things I want to go away and study afterwards. So uh, it's, it's fantastic to have these questions and also speak with have the other experts as well. And to, to that end, I'd like to thank Sigvaris and yourself for, for setting this up. It's very good. And I think uh, even though we're out of the pandemic, I think that these at a weekend are very useful for us to keep our brains in action, especially when we see patients uh, so much during the week. 
So I've, I've been given the, the title uh, male pelvic congestion syndrome, which is um, a, a, a thing that's become fascinating for us, um, especially since we published a, a paper, which I'll come to, uh, which caused uh, quite a lot of uh, concern or uh, skepticism. And we'll, we'll talk about this. Can you all see the screen sharing? Yes, that's good because it's suddenly disappeared from my computer, which is wonderful. There we go. And we'll just change that over. Lovely. Is that, is that okay for everyone? Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. So um, I've been asked to speak about uh, pelvic congestion syndrome in males. And as I say, this is, I think, a very big growth area. Those of us who have been interested in pelvic congestion syndrome in females, and we're really teasing out that it used to be thought to be only women who were... Um, who were fertile and who'd had children. And that's been shown to be uh, complete rubbish. And in fact, we've uh, published a paper on the College of Phlebology preprint server, which is uh, available already. And it's going to be, um, uh, it's already been submitted as well and it's going through the review process. So hopefully uh, it will get through the review process and get into a, a journal as well. And in that, we've shown that 10% of women with PCS who come to our unit have, are, have never had children and 25% are postmenopausal. So this idea that it only affects fertile females is rubbish. And obviously it's rubbish that it only affects females in any case, because all of us know about pelvic congestion in males, although we don't call it that. So I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. So as you've already heard from very good uh, previous uh, lecture, uh, we know a lot now about the um, pelvic uh, congestion syndrome or pelvic venous disorders if we're following uh, what we're being instructed to by certain elements uh, in this area. I'm not 100% sure what's going to come out. I think we're still in a process of uh, how we go forward with this. And as we talked before, um, as Mohammed just told you, uh, Professor Al Farouk, uh, we published this paper quite some time ago now, 2009, where we studied how many patients coming to see us, female patients coming to see us, who had this classic sort of uh, varicose vein coming down from the back of the, uh, the thigh, from the paravulval region. And you can see there's a scar um, anterior to it where somebody's tried to treat it before. And this is what really led us as vein surgeons into the idea of pelvic congestion. We found that a lot of our colleagues were still doing high tie and strip and re doing redo, 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 only to find that the veins were coming down from, the, uh, from somewhere in the pelvis. And I've got slight concern about um, the sort of idea that we should only be treating these veins externally and not examining the patients if the patients don't tell us they've got a clear history of symptoms. And there's, uh, I think we can sort of talk about it in the discussion because there's a lot around whether that's actually right. I know it sort of sounds sensible, but I'm not sure uh, whether it is okay. So we know that this affects an awful lot of women. And um, in the, when we first looked at it, we know it's massively underdiagnosed. And very simply, we know there are symptoms that are both internal and external to the pelvis. And there are signs that are external to the pelvis in the legs. And you can have reflux, which is by far the most common, and then you can have obstruction. And as you've heard, the SVP has tried to put this into some form of CEAP type score. I think the I think we should all try to use this because I think it's got to develop into something more useful. And the trouble is with the CEAP score, as we all know, we all think the CEAP score is wonderful, except for all of us only know C. And if you if you ever ask a, a venous surgeon about the EAP, they have to really think about it because we only we always talk about CEAP, but we just really talk about the C. And there's no part of this that you can correlate just to the C. You can't just turn around and say clinically they're this, whereas you can do that simply when you're doing legs, because have they got an ulcer, have they got swelling, have they got varicose veins, are they symptomatic or not? The C part's all important. And this doesn't give us that simplistic view. So that's why I quite like those people, look, several people have got the same sort of idea where you talk about what's in the pelvis, what's in the legs, and what's in both. And I think really we're sort of, I think that's the, the future, we've got to simplify it if we are going to use the SVP. However, going over to the male, how do we know males get pelvic congestion? Very simply, because when we go to medical school, the first time we turn up, we're shocked to find that, unless we've had one ourselves, the first time we find out about this is when we turn up at medical school and tell us you can get varicose veins around the testicle. 
Now, this should not really be a surprise. Um, you know, we all know varicose seals exist and we all get told in the first few weeks of medical school that this condition exists. And so it's really quite amazing. It's taken so long for us to think that the female testicle, which is called the ovary, gets the same thing, which is, of course, your pelvic congestion. So it doesn't matter if you're male or female and you get varicose veins around your gonad because of the way it develops. And we also know men get hemorrhoids, as do women. So we all know that the trouble is varicose seals are seen by urologists and hemorrhoids tend to be seen by coloproctologists. And so because of that, as we, we tend to ignore this, but this is clear indication we should have always known that men get pelvic congestion syndrome. And historically, we know that with the testicle and the uh, ovary, they both come from the neurogenital wrist, ridge. The, um, we know that as the fetus unfolds, uh, the, the gonad comes down into the pelvis and it brings with it its artery and vein, and we all get taught this at medical school. Unfortunately, we also get taught that the testicular vein has no connections of note, and we know this is now incorrect in the female because we know that the gonadal vein has multiple connections with the interline vein and all of that, those huge, great big varicosities that you saw in uh, Tobias's lecture on the ultrasound, they're all being fed by these four different sources. And so it's not surprising that although this becomes external, this is also not correct. The vetistic vein has many connections that develop over time. So we published this paper, and I think this is 2017, we published it in Phlebology, and we pointed out that having had one in six women turning up having uh, with leg varicose veins turning out to have a major pelvic uh, component, we then showed that, in fact, one in 30 men have the same thing. They have, when you scan this vein and look at it, it looks like it's coming as a tributary that's uh, dilated from the sphenofemoral junction, but in fact, it's behind the adductor longus. And uh, when you follow it up and look with the ultrasound, this man actually had pelvic venous reflux and had a normal great saphenous vein. So what might pelvic congestion syndrome in a male comprise of? Well, comprise of? We've already seen varicose seals, we've seen hemorrhoids, we now know leg varicose veins. Uh, Ram's done some fantastic work on impotence. Chronic pelvic pain, this is fairly obvious. If women get it, there's no reason mentioned. And there's uh, increasing numbers of papers that are saying that prostatism or prostitis, I mean, many patients, is associated with venous stasis and large veins, so much the same way that people are now starting to agree with what we proposed for some time that a lot of people with interstitial cystitis also have these large veins, and it may well be not an infective problem that we can't find, but it may well be uh, the sign of uh, inflammation, the same way that you get uh, lipodermatous sclerosis and leg ulcers in a leg. Uh, in pelvic veins, you might well be getting inflammation in the lower pelvis. So this is becoming much more of an interesting area than just saying there's a few veins that dilate. In the male varicose seal, we know it's common and progressive. We know it can lead to subfertility and infertility. And there's a very good pa uh, Turkish paper here that uh, has provided us this uh, uh, information, but there are several others that you can reference. Now, let's think about this. We've known about varicose seals, certainly since I've been a medical student and a doctor, so it's not a new thing. Um, in fact, that's um, over, unfortunately over 30 years. And um, we know that you can just uh, look at just with an ultrasound. We know that you ligate these or embolize them, you get good results. Um, how many of these patients, how many urologists look for nutcracker syndrome and consider stenting and transplanting? The answer is vanishingly few. This is treated in young men very, very simply by either embolization or surgery. And nutcracker syndrome, we know, is incredibly rare. But as soon as this becomes an ovary and it's inside, um, uh, many doctors around the world uh, are saying, you know, a lot of these, I've seen pe people up to saying up to 40% are due to nutcracker syndrome in females, although we certainly know that's not the case in males. So I think when we look across the sexes, it sort of in, uh, makes us understand that reflux is far more important than obstruction, unless you have some form of post-thrombotic uh, post syndrome on anatomical abnormality. As far as hemorrhoids are concerned, we, uh, we published this paper some time ago in 2014, and we showed that the um, uh, basically a third of women with hemorrhoids have associated very significant reflux in the internal iliac vein. We don't know whether it's causative, but it's an association. It's like everything we looked at when we looked very early about 
um, in, in the females for pelvic veins when we looked about perforators. And of course, eventually you do find it is causative in some people, but you start off by showing an association. And this is what we've done here. Um, we know that colorectal surgeons for many years have done uh, hemorrhoidectomy, uh, sorry, they've used a proctoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. They haven't gone looking for a Mayferner syndrome or Neville. They've gone for proctoscopy, sigmoidoscopy. They treat using uh, hemorrhoidectomy staples uh, of the hemorrhoid itself, the sclerotherapy, the halo procedure of the arteries, direct thermal ablation. And again, they don't look for some form of compression syndrome causing it. Um, and they get pretty good results, certainly with some of the more recent techniques. And if they combined it with a venous a treatment on the inside, they might get better results. And I suspect that most of those would be an anti-reflux treatment, as in females, rather than any stenting. So now we go on to the leg varicose veins, which we've already touched upon. And this was our publication where we showed this correlation between some men, um, uh, one in 30, who had leg varicose veins predominantly from the pelvis. And when we published it, we got uh, Melvin Rosenblatt, who's sadly not with us anymore, but he was really quite a, quite a vitriolic about it. And he said, well, this is rubbish because, of course, you know, the, uh, the gonadal vein doesn't, uh, in the man, doesn't connect with leg veins. So we had to write back into phlebology, and we've done this several times, and we've shown that, in fact, the, we've got uh, this patient who's got a clear duplex communication from the right testicular varicose seal over to the sphenofemoral junction and causing a truncal varicose veins in this case. Uh, there's a patient, this is, I believe this is the one that we actually published in phlebology to refute what he'd said. And you can see clearly here, this vein coming from a left varicose seal on this side and going into leg varicose veins. And this one actually went into an incompetent GSV, which was competent at the saphenofemoral junction. Here's another one here where the connection, this patient's already had previous embolization of the gonadal vein, but is still got a varicose seal because there's a communication between leg varicose veins and the varicose seal through the inguinal canal. So we know that it's much more complex in men. The, all of these, of course, would be hidden in that, we would just call it a plexiform, a, a plexus of veins. And we wouldn't try to look at the anatomical abnormalities in a woman because it's all just a lot of veins communicating, either being fed by ovarian veins or interlilate vein tributaries or combinations of veins. But once it's outside in a male and we have anatomical landmarks, then it really becomes more complex because we have to understand that these veins can have many different routes. When we go on, we'll come back to that in a bit, but I just want to go through the different things that can constitute um, incompetent uh, uh, male pelvic congestion. So impotence is something I've personally not got into at the moment because there's been some amazingly good work done initially by urologists showing that 16.7% of male impotence is venogenic. Um, and there's a, a long history of doing uh, ligations for these. But of course, RAM has been doing amazing work in Singapore and really shocked the world with uh, a talk he came at the Charing Cross and has uh, published since. And he has quite, he's developing a really good protocol for men who have uh, venogenic uh, impotence and how to, first of all, diagnose it and then how to treat it from below with glue uh, to stop the reflux. And so I think this is going to be a major area of um, uh, looking at, at venous disease in the pelvis, which is tr at the moment probably not being optimally looked at by urologists, similarly to gynecologists are at the moment not optimally looking at female pelvic congestion syndrome. Um, chronic pelvic pain, we know women get chronic pelvic pain with uh, pelvic congestion syndrome. And there's now, uh, it's fairly clear from many publications, about 30% of women attending gynecology outpatients have got pelvic congestion syndrome as the source of their chronic pelvic pain, although they rarely get diagnosed by gynecologists. In men, there's this chronic pelvic pain syndrome, and the prevalence is somewhere between two and 16%. And the thing with this is it's really difficult because whereas women have got a simple place to go to, which is a gynecologist, and even if they don't get diagnosed, at least they get picked up by the system and get counted. There isn't really an equivalent outpatient for men to go to. If you've got chronic pain, you might be sent 
to hernia, you might be sent to colorectal surgeons, you might be sent musculoskeletal, you might be get to sexual health, you might be sent to urologists or andrologists. So really there's no one draining point to pick up these men. So this is really difficult area to research. And prostatitis as well, it's not surprising if you ever have a plexus of veins, which is fed by reflux, or even if it's not fed by reflux, if you just have a plexus of veins where the blood doesn't move very much, just enough so you don't get thrombosis, then you will get this buildup of metabolites, you'll get a decrease of your pH, and you'll get inflammation. And that's what we see in true gravitational ulcers of the legs. And this is what we see in probably interstitial cystitis and certainly some cases of IBS, but also we see in prostatitis. And I think we're going to see more and more interest of the damage that venous stasis, reflux and obstruction causes at the cellular level by, at an, as by inflammatory proteins and cells. So one of the things that I'm very interested in all, all, all of these, so now we've sort of talked about the conditions they cause, is what the underlying venous problem is. So what proportion is obstruction, either the classic nutcrackers we've heard about at the left renal vein, the metherna classically at the left uh, common iliac, or non-thrombotic non iliac vein lesion nivel, which can affect usually the iliac veins on either side. Or how much is reflux in the testicular veins or internal iliac veins in men? Well, we also, we've known and we've published previously that a true nutcracker, if we did an embolization of the gonadal vein, we would make things worse. And we've known because in our clinic, we rarely, rarely, rarely um, uh, ever send people for nutcracker. We, we've published previously and actually won a prize at the American, uh, in 2019, we won a, a prize at the American College of Phlebology, which is now the AVLS. Um, showing that people who appeared to have nutcracker beforehand, but with left uh, significant left ovarian vein reflux, when we embolized them, the nutcracker disappeared because we weren't hiving blood off down. And so it didn't collapse the vein under the superior mesenteric. So unlike um, what you heard before about standing the patient up, which certainly does work, and I agree it does. But one of the other things you can do quite nicely is you can tip the patient into Trendelenburg. So here on the left-hand side, you can see the, the um, a clear picture transversely of the um, aorta. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we've got the aorta sitting on the spine. We've got the superior mesenteric artery above, and both of them as circles. And right between them, they've got this very, very pinched nutcracker, by the looks of it, um, of the renal vein being squashed really uh, intensely here. And the ratio can be measured when we measure the velocity at 6.2. So by all criteria, that is a nutcracker. If you tip that person into Trendelenburg, and what you're doing here is you're mimicking the same idea that you've embolized the left ovarian vein, because now you don't have flow going uphill. So all that flow is going the right way. Lo and behold, that that whole area just opens up. You're not losing the blood down into the pelvis. It's not following the pathway of least resistance and it's going straight the way through. And so we can now predict which patients we can go on that even if the MRI, CT, anything at all appears, as long as it's static, if it appears to show a nutcracker, tip the patient to Trendelenburg and we're confident in those patients that if this disappears, this is a pseudo nutcracker and therefore we can carry on with embolization. So what happens when we look at the nivel or the metherna? And this, there's a very good um, study, uh, there's a very good uh, thing on YouTube, if you want to see it, of a pseudo uh, nutcracker. Um, and it's by Claude Franceschi. He's put a, a, it up. And you can actually see this. And we've seen it ourselves. I was actually involved at Link. And I was seeing a patient having a stent being put into the, um, uh, into the left common iliac and I was quite surprised because what was happening the patient clearly had massive reflux into the internal iliac veins on the side and we would have actually coil embolized the that massive reflux but the radiologist was very very adamant that if there's reflux it must be trying to bypass a Maytherna syndrome which there was a glimmer of so we would never treat somebody without a functional test and so we used the uh, Chris Latimer and Evie Keladiki who unfortunately again uh, Eva, you probably know, isn't with us anymore, but Chris still does this. And with using air plasmography, and not the air plasmography with two cuffs, 
where you have a sensory cuff and occlusion cuff, which isn't good. This is a single cuff technique. You put it around the, um, the calf, you lie the patient down, lift the leg up, and you should see an instant falling out of blood from the leg. And if you do that, you can rest assured that anything that you see on static imaging as a nibble or a Mayferner syndrome is irrelevant functionally. And so we would never treat somebody unless we could find a functional problem as well as something we saw anatomically. And I think if we would rely a bit more on functional tests, we would actually probably um, keep away from difficulties that we're going to have in the future of people who are having normal veins stented. And I have a great worry uh, that uh, there are going to be cases going through courts in the futures of people having normal veins stented and then getting into one hyperplasia and getting into trouble. So it, uh, my thing that I said every lecture at the moment on this area, I say you have to earn your stent. So before you ever think of stenting, be absolutely certain you need a stent. So um, there was a question in the last section, um, which I answered, so I didn't get asked, just about the what size of ovarian vein should worry about or testicular vein. And we've already proven that that is, uh, despite certain authorities saying six millimetres or eight millimetres in women, we know that's not the case. If you look at size versus reflux, there is absolutely no correlation at all. So if you, it's really very important not to st still be talking about diameters of veins to look for pathology, it's not relevant. What we want to see is we want to see flow and reflux and that we published that, I think that was 2008. Uh, the difficulty with transabdominal duplex is that you can see the truncal veins, but you can't see the distal veins. And also you can only really see good images in slimmer people. Uh, uh, it's, it's harder the bigger you get. So I'm very worried about um, ed transabdominal unless you use transvaginal. And that's why using the whole stock Harrison protocol where you uh, lie the patient at 45 degrees, we've published this in uh, 2006 and we've done a lot of work on this. And if you use a Kegel squeeze, where the, uh, the patient squeezes their own buttocks, uh, together and Valsalva, you get the same sort of uh, reflux that you would see if you use manual calf compression. So it's just mimicking all the things we do in the legs and trying to keep away from all the mistakes we made in the 80s and 90s of trying to use other sorts of imaging and non-functional imaging um, uh, uh, in the pelvis. So we're trying to not to make those go through that same history that we had to go through in the legs to prove duplex is the easiest way to get the majority of the information you need. Not all of it, but the majority. However, it is restricted to consenting females. And that comes to our problem, because how do we look at men? And so this is some new research that we only presented at the UIP recently. We looked at the different reflux connections, and there are loads of them. So you've got the testicular veins, you've got the interlinear veins, you've got the whole of the plexus around the uh, prostate and the bladder. We've got clipper Tulloni syndrome, which in our series two of them had. We've also got ab interior abdominal walls and of course varicose seals and the spermatic veins that come, that there are connections to the legs. So we looked at a retrospective of, uh, of 54 patients, 49 years mean, uh, 22 to 74. These are all patients who turned up to the majority with leg varicose veins, it must be said, but some did come for pelvic congestion type syndromes. The, with three of them did have obstruction, and so we excluded them, so that took it down to 51. And of those, the, we had 86 limbs left over to look at, with most of them actually with C4, that's why they had come to see us. That's just showing the obstruction patients that were excluded, or two of them. All of these patients, we tried to do a transrectal ultrasound and it isn't good. The patients generally don't like it. It gives very poor views. There's a lot of gas and fecal matter. So what we did instead is transabdominal, tran uh, testicular, inguinal canal, suprapubic and posterior scrotum. Four patients just were too big and uh, we couldn't see it or had too much gas and peristalsis. These are just a couple of the examples of the sorts of complexities though you see. There's this patient, for instance, had reflux of the sphenofemoral junction that was coming, being fed from uh, epigastric vein, but also from communicating veins from the testicular veins. This patient came and had a very complex with perforators coming out through the sciatic notch, coming down as well as having a varicose seal, which wasn't directly linked. 
So when we look at this, the abnormal pelvis to legs, uh, TV to groin, um, testicular vein, this is to groin, to iliac vein, internal iliac vein, so external iliac vein, superview, abdominal wall. It's a whole host of different communications. These are patients turning up, uh, mainly erectile dysfunction, then pelvic pain, testicular scrotal pain, going all the way down to sensory loss of the groin and the penis. Um, and those are the ones that came with the pelvic congestion syndrome uh, type symptoms, as is the eight and also the ones that are the 14 there who had all that, and as well as leg syndrome. So there wasn't any clear uh, set of symptoms that showed us which vein it was coming from. We also found that although testicular veins were more common than internal ilia veins, um, when we started looking for the leg symptoms, um, it was both internal veins as well as uh, testicular veins, as well as PCS. But what it meant is when we tried to look at the pattern, this is the pattern with most of the patients. If you had to look at the, the commonest, it was bilateral testicular vein reflux and bilateral internal ilia. And if you then had to look at the second commonest, it was bilateral testicular vein reflux, which is in stark contrast with what we found in our females, where 45% of all of our females had bilateral internal iliac vein reflux with left testicular, uh, with sort of left ovarian vein reflux. So it's quite interesting that in our women, and we've done three different studies showing that it's mainly an internal iliac problem, pelvic congestion and legs. In men, that doesn't seem to be the case, certainly with these very complex ones. And we don't understand why that anatomy is different. So the conclusions, bilateral um, venous reflux is more common than unilateral, and obstruction is much less common than reflux alone, which is what we find in females as well. Um, if you only look at imaging without function, you will overestimate obstruction. I think that's uh, true for females as well. And the difference in anatomy with women makes imaging incredibly difficult because we don't have the transvaginal route, and that's a very difficult route. So really what we have to understand is this is the beginning of a lot of work that's needed it's very underestimated pelvic congestion syndrome in men it's not understood it's often not considered it's not looked for and there's no single diagnostic technique or combination which is a gold standard at the moment and so this is a fertile area for research but unfortunately for our patients it means that although we can cure some of them there's an awful lot that we don't even get the whole answer for and never mind work out what the best treatment for them is at the present thank you sorry you you're, you're muted ma'am another masterpiece from uh, from my dearest mark Excellent presentation. Enjoyed every second of it. I would like to hear uh, the comment from uh, my dear panelists, uh, Professor Tobias and Professor uh, Dugansi, and Professor um, Wang from China. Tobias. You need to unmute. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, um, for the conclusion. The point is um, more research is um, required. Uh, the point is we, uh, if you don't think about PVD, you, you won't um, find it in women and the same with, um, with male patients. And at the moment, uh, each of the, the, the males, uh, each of the men we see in our practice are very, very individual and not comparable to the others I have seen. And so it's always if if they have a longer um, a patient history with uh, uh, urological uh, problems or something like that, the point is we have to inform the colleagues, the urologists, uh, logists, and uh, uh, all the people who who don't care about the veins in the pelvis um, that there is there exists uh, a disease like that, and that's the point. And my experience is that um, in both gynecologists and urologists, the interests and uh, the sensitivity for that problem is very, very low. And this is what we have to do more and more. Um, in that case, we will find the patients to get research. We, we, we don't have uh, the opportunity to, uh, um, to, to increase uh, the research uh, if we don't uh, can collect uh, the cases. 
if I can answer that as well, because I think you're absolutely right. And uh, one of my colleagues, when I was trying to explain to her, she's a gynecologist and a good friend of mine. And she she used to laugh at my work back in 2005, 2006, when I was trying to get people to understand it. And one time she turned around to me and she said, I don't know why you've gone about pelvic congestion. She said, I do a lot of laparoscopy for women with pelvic pain and they all have big veins. You know, I don't know that it's just natural. And I said, but you're seeing the problem and not identifying it. And I think we have a lot of this problem, even with our vascular colleagues who do veins, but are more interested in arteries. And also, um, you know, general practitioners and nurses, you see a vein. And you see reflux and duplex, but they don't understand that that causes inflammation if it's left long enough. And you do actually get physical inflammatory changes and as well as symptoms with venous disease. And I think, you know, the whole thing, you're right, is underestimated at legs level is underestimated. But certainly in the pelvic veins, you know, we, we really haven't scratched the surface of getting our message to the people who are seeing the patients. Excellent. Uh, Professor Suad Duganzi, uh, any comments? Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Whiteley. As always, it was a wonderful presentation. And as we also discussed in the first session about the female counterpart, the male, male uh, pelvic congestion is uh, much more, I think, under, underestimated in our practice. And I also 100% agree with Tobias that our urologic, urologist friends uh, also are not aware of, uh, just, they are treating those uh, uh, testicular varicosities, but they are also and they they don't know the uh, source of reflux and what, wh where are they coming from. So several times I had also uh, discussions with our urologist friends, but as you know, from the financial uh, perspective, or uh, they don't want to lose uh, their patients uh, mostly. But this is a uh, vascular uh, problem, and the the thing that I am doing or uh, making a negotiation with the urologist. Uh, since they are just uh, making the uh, varicocell part of the disease, uh, they are also having many recurrent cases uh, since they are not uh, treating the uh, source of reflux. Uh, I, I made a, uh, a negotiation with them. Uh, is it possible if we have a refluxing patients, uh, re recurring patients, maybe we, we can uh, analyze the cause of the reflux by this way? I had some uh, referrals from the urologist. So instead of uh, making, uh, let's say, discussion with them, uh, making such type of negotiations, have a chance to that we are able to see that recurring patients because they also hate recurring patients. But by, by this way, uh, we have a chance to observe the, those patients and uh, to see the source of reflux because the male, the male part, as uh, Dr. Whiteley explained to us, is much more maybe complicated from than the female part, and uh, they uh, need more expertise and more time to analyze what what is the causing problem. But I definitely agree with all all these uh, comments that this is the this is a vascular problem, and we need to deal with those patients as well. And thank you very much uh, for the, giving me the opportunity to be a part of this wonderful meeting. Yeah. And Professor Wang, do you like to have a comment? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, not comment, but thank you. It's my pleasure to hear this wonderful present, uh, wonderful speak. And as a newcomer of a PVD doctor, I have a technical question. So uh, we know if we do the embolization to the uh, male, uh, there may be one side effect, um, pumping, pumping from plexus uh, phlebitis. So uh, how, how, how much, how many wings should we be embolized? Uh, and uh, how can we control this uh, scleral scent? Thank you. Thank you. And that, that's one of the major differences between males and females, because at the moment we would be comfortable in doing sclerotherapy to varicosities of the scrotum. Um, we're comfortable doing um, embolization of the testicular vein down to the internal ring. Uh, and we'd be comfortable at using the trollop technique, which is um, what we described with a thermal ablation to uh, areas that were like perforators. 
But I think we've got to be incredibly careful about talking about sclerotherapy to pamponiform plexus and to test the testicular veins, be, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the varicocele itself, because that's going to be incredibly painful. So uh, the simple answer is uh, we have to try and take all of the sources of reflux away and try and let it shrink down by itself. Um, I, I think you're going to be a very brave person uh, and uh, who's going to be the first to start scler putting scler sclerosant into the veins around the testicle. The inflammation would be horrendous. So uh, your, your question is very, very astute because um, not only do we have to not only do we have to do the research into the different patterns, but also what the optimal treatments are going to be. And just the same way that we are all arguing about the best way to treat females, you know, this is the beginning of the discussions for the best way to treat males. Yes. Okay, that's Thank great. You, yeah, <clears throat> I have I have two questions uh, put into the QA section, and also we can open any of the attendee to open the mic like Professor Martin Marish from Bahrain or Professor Patel from India. So uh, let me take the first Q&A question to Mark. Is there, contra is there is a contraindication to treat, to treat leg varicose vein in presence of pelvic congestion syndrome or which one do you treat first? Uh, so the, the answer to that question really is, um, are you talking about pelvic congestion syndrome or are you talking about pelvic vein reflux? So if we're talking about major reflux, and this is my, my problem with the female as well, is when, when you saw uh, with Tobias's lecture, what they're saying at the moment in the European uh, thing that it, in the European guidelines, and it was only 3C, but if you've got leg varicose veins and no pelvic congestion symptoms, but you've got major reflux, they're saying don't treat that reflux in the first instance, which is clearly rubbish. That would be a bit like saying, if you've got great big varicose veins on your calf and you've got massive reflux in your great saphenous vein, just treat the calf veins, don't treat the, the underlying great saphenous vein, which no one would do. So it's not thinking logically. So what we need to do is we need to say, what is the pattern? If, if, you, if your leg varicose veins have got huge great big trunks coming from, or huge great big uh, amounts of blood coming from the pelvic veins, then not treating them first, you're just going to get recurrences. Now, if all you've got is if you've got pelvic congestion symptoms and there might be just one or two very small communications, they're not going to significantly impact on your leg varicose veins. So in that case, yeah, you're going to treat the leg varicose veins and think about the pelvic congestion as a separate issue. So that's the key to it is there's no you, we can't group all of these together. I think what we really need is we need some sort of measure of what percentage or what amount of the leg varicose veins is arising from pelvic vein reflux. And that's a separate issue from pelvic congestion and the symptoms itself, which is a separate issue, really, although obviously they're linked. Yeah. Uh, the other question we got also is a little bit of a long question. He said, thank you very much for an excellent topic. Uh, this question is from Cyrus Albasi. According to diversity and complexity of pelvic venous drainage, if occlusion or deletion of gonadal veins completely treats the symptom, I mean, do we have an RCT to evaluate the efficacy of gonadal vein ligation? He, I think what he's meaning is you, you embolize or ligate gonadal vein, uh, which obviously you leave some behind. So, what is the effect? Because we haven't seen, for example, gangrene due to like what we see in the leg with phlegmasia serola dolens, where you get the venous causation up to gangrene. This doesn't happen in the pelvis. So have we got an evidence how much to inject, to which place, how much to leave? Or what is the technicality about it? There's certainly no randomized controlled study because that's a really uh, that's a very small point. I think if it comes down to the difference between um, a coil embolization or a ligation, I think that nowadays um, we, it would it would probably be unethical to do the study because we know that ligations of veins in the legs lead to neovascularization and recurrence. Um, yeah. It might be that they'd get one or two studies which would allow to do it but i think i think we now understand that you need transmural death you need ablation of the vein and the, uh, the only question is is how do you achieve that and over what length 
Um, I don't think that, certainly if you're only treating incompetent veins, then ablation of them shouldn't be a problem. Uh, the only thing would be unless you're in a major trunk, you know, and like you say, you know, that would have to be your common iliac vein, your external iliac vein or your deep veins. But I don't think that, you know, that, that's clearly not the case with testicular veins. But the key to all of this is expert duplex and only ever treat incompetence or stasis. And then if you find obstruction, dilate it. Excellent. Um, if any of the attendees want uh, to voice their question, I know we have plenty of uh, big authority, like Professor Martin Marish from Bahrain, Professor Patel from India. If you have any burning question, you can we can unmute yourself if you raise your hand. Um, I can't see any, so... Uh, I have a question. Oh, oh, please oh. go ahead. Uh, I have a yeah. question about about the technique. <laughs> so, okay. uh, what's your, all of you, what's your sequence of procedure? You do sclerotherapy first or you do uh, coiling first? Uh, um, okay. To answer that's the last speaker, for me, it would come down to it, it just on the patient. I'd make it, uh, I'd, I'd see what the anatomy was of the patient and what the problem. If there's major truncal reflux, you have to do coil first because that may shrink away distal veins. If you try and put, if you've got major reflux, you do sclerosis, sclerotherapy first, you know that sclerotherapy is not a long-term solution in a thick walled vein. We know it doesn't work in the long, there's a randomized studies to show that in leg veins and we know it doesn't work. And if you put sclerotherapy into a, a varicosities beneath reflux and haven't fixed the reflux, then you get very poor, poor results as well. So what you try to do is switch off the reflux first and then do foam, unless you can do it all by foam if you've got thin walled and thin veins. Okay, uh, do you like to uh, uh, answer questions, Swat Dugansi or Tobias? Swat, first. I would not completely agree with uh, Mark in uh, that case because um, recurrent varicose veins is a problem that, that we are used to know. We know that uh, uh, recurrent veins are always possible. And um, so uh, it uh, depends on the wish of the patient because a sclerotherapy and also uh, a repeated one is uh, a 10 minutes issue. But on the other hand, um, a coiling is a big deal. So uh, we have to be clear uh, that we can um, suggest, uh, we can offer our patients um, uh, the big deal procedure with the, uh, with the coiling and plugs and all these issues, but we cannot uh, be sure that there is that there won't be any type of recurrence uh, after that. And uh, if uh, if there are young women, um, so they get X-rays, they get uh, the uh, contrast media and all these things. And so I think to start with the sclerotherapy um, is a uh, better um, mode. And if it if you get the second or third um, recurrence, uh, you have to talk about that. We, you know that um, that the, the the source of the uh, of the reflux is in the uh, gonadal vein, and uh, you have to offer that. You can talk about uh, that with your patients, but I would not recommend that as uh, the first uh, uh, treatment option. I, I think because um, it's. It, it's, okay. it, it, it can't be a recommendation because we have not that many people who are able to perform uh, this type of treatment um, uh, that it's uh, possible for all for all people that uh, are suffering from that kind of uh, varicose vein. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure this topic will go into standardization. Yeah, do you like to come back, Mark? Yeah, I will not come back so much. I agree largely with what Tobias says. I think it's a conversation with your pa patient. I mean, patients come to see me because our reputation is that we're aggressive and they've got we've got a very, very, very low recurrence rate because we try to treat them in one go. 
Um, and one of the things that we discussed with Mel Rosenbratz um, uh, in that in the paper I quoted was he said, well, you know, do the leg veins first, and if they come back, then do the power veins. And I said, well, that's fine, as long as you've discussed it with your patients, and they're prepared to come back again and pay for it again and have it done. But if you want it all done with the lowest recurrence rate in the first time, then this is the way. And it is, you're, Tobias is absolutely right, it's a discussion of the patient and a cost and, and benefit analysis. I, I also will just bring up one case, which unfortunately I, I'm trying to publish, but I'm, I'm waiting for the patient to give me um, her permission, and I'm not sure she's going to, so this might be the only time it's ever presented, because at least I can talk about her, um, mm -hmm. because it's not a, a, I'm not presenting her, her, her photos or anything. And she's a lady who came to us from um, another European country and then came to England. She's been treated by two different people before. And I think this is also another thing that uh, Tobias would probably agree with as well, that it's not only stenting, it's not, sorry, it's not only um, coils, but it's also doing coils well. Because this patient has had coil embolization by two different doctors for massive ovarian vein reflux with huge vulvar varicose veins. And she came to us and said, you know, you've written about this and it doesn't work. Look at my varicose veins. But when we did the duplex scan and transvaginal, they put these coils in so badly, the coils are holding the vein open. And the coils, there are so few coils and they're so oversized that they've actually stented the vein. So they've actually worsened her. So I think one of the things we also have to remember is when we're discussing these techniques is not, no technique's got a 100% success rate. So there's, there's, there's the doing the technique, but there's also the risks of the technique and also the, the, the success or failure rate of doing the techniques and who's doing it. So I think that's also a thing uh, you know, that we have to throw into the mix as well. And that's why it's not a perfect world. Excellent, excellent. I would like also to come to the conversation from uh, Professor Martin Marish. He's a vascular surgeon, well-known in Bahrain and well-known in the Gulf. He has a huge venous practice. Uh, practice. Uh, go ahead, Martin. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I just want to congratulate. It's, it's great to see a lot of friends uh, getting together, discussing a hot topic of, of pelvic congestion. I can just comment on, on what uh, you have already highlighted. It's obvious that the weakest point is... Uh, is uh, is absence of, of the diagnostic tools because in the pelvis we just we just miss the the benefit of the ultrasound which which is confirmed the best diagnostic tool for the lower limbs. Uh, that's first the, the problem of, of axial images is that you know presence of big body positive can indicate the, the venous problem but uh, you don't really know the, the problem because you don't have a dynamic uh, images. So this might be perhaps a way to go to get the dynamic images and functional tests to identify either obstruction or the or the reflux. Because because therapeutic tools are here. Yeah, the coils work, the embo agents work, and stents works for work for for obstructions. So I guess this is going to be the most important uh, point to focus on. Thank you very much for the opportunity and and enjoy, it, gentlemen. Okay. Do you like to answer this one, Mark? I, I, I think he's. I think he's absolutely right, and I think that's yeah. one of the things that's come down. I think it yeah. is all about you know that that the, making the diagnosis using enough tools that are functional. My worry with these functional MRIs and stuff, they're sort of okay for the long veins, but they don't tell you anything about the small curly veins. Exactly. And so you know, and we just don't have a, a gold standard at the moment. Absolutely. Plus, we are working. We are working in a very low pressure and very slow flow system that uh, also the gravity plays a very important role. So we have to find out the diagnostic tool which can work in a different positions. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you, Martin. Uh, um, and this is very good lesson for all, uh, all young colleagues starting to treat uh, pelvic congestion syndrome is not to treat how they look like, but to treat the functional and be absolutely sure about the correct diagnosis. Otherwise, you will miss malignancy. You will miss um, severe endometriosis. You will miss a lot of pathology. So you have to go very carefully in this regard and to assess the function before the anatomy, I think is a crucial point. So uh, my dear is to call moderator, uh, Selvian. Uh, how do you like to go from there? Thanks, Dr. Omar. I think we will just show the first uh, poll question just to conclude the discussion. Then, uh, So the first one is, which on the, of the following is a common symptom of pelvic congestion syndrome in men? 
There is uh, one single choice. We give you a few seconds to answer this. Do we have a result already, Colin? Okay, this looks very even for the first two answers. Uh, any comment from your side, uh, Mark? Uh, the right answer was uh, the the first one. I, I would I would say erectile dysfunction is uh, according to the slide I showed. <laughs> 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 Great. Uh, we, we have a second one that you can show, Colin. Okay. Which of the following is a common diagnostic test for pelvic congestion syndrome in men? Also here, single choice. Let me give you a few seconds to answer that. Well, number one, in men, there is no transvaginal ultrasound. That's yeah. out of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can we see the results? Maybe we have a surprise there. <laughs> I hope I not. I hope no one will will take this one. Because <laughs> there was could be a problem. At this day and age, that might start a whole new discussion. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, in the Royal College, we avoid putting question on pelvic <laughs> congestion syndrome because of this reason. <laughs> okay. okay, that's good. Great. Any comment on the feedback here? No. Great. Yeah, this yes, was really that's right. Uh, trans abdominal, yes, but we need to train our ultrasound to diagnose such a disease, and we need to write protocol and we write diagnostic criteria. So, uh, um, as Mark said, he's opening the door for new diseases, new discovery. We are going away, I think we are still in the beginning. And as Tobias have said, there is a lot of research need to be done in order to reach a conclusion for these diseases, but. Uh, at least the compression is still uh, according to some authority can play a part, uh, which is, is good news. Uh, there is still place for some drug treatment, which is another good news. And we hope to collect all this expert in one platform to get advice online uh, through the MOH and to help young doctors the beginning of your career. Uh, I really enjoyed being part of this fascinating uh, scientific venture. And the mic is back to you, Selvi. Yeah, thanks, Omar. This is really great. Thank you, thank you to you, uh, Omar. First line uh, for the moderation of this of this event, and thanks for the speakers and and also the expert panelists for the participation. This was really a great meeting that we had, and I, I enjoyed a lot the the presentations and also the the really good discussions. Uh, I would like to have the more time to to continue the discussion it was really extremely interesting and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward for the next occasion where we can uh, meet together and 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 uh, organize the next uh, moh uh, to discuss uh, further topics and, and new results coming out in this uh, very interesting area of, of, of uh, research um, any comments from your side also maybe to to uh, the, the the discussions that we had or the final words uh, very appreciated also from my side thank you very much thank you yeah.